Hello, and welcome to the 80th gathering of the Adventure Party on this, the 3rd of September, 2017. I'm your party leader, Brad Ludwig. We ask that you peace tie your swords, holster your blasters, and make sure you have your alien life form guidebook close at hand while you are gathered at the meeting table. Uh, this meeting of the Adventure Party is brought to you by Patreon partners Growly Bear and Brian Jensen. And we'll tell you a little bit more later on on how you too can become a partner with the Galactic Network, uh, Netcast Network. Whew. There we go. All right. This time, now we, we spoke with uh, Paris Crenshaw last week, mm -hmm. who uh, does some work with Legendary Games. And we were fortunate enough to have Jason Nelson to be our guest. And Jason, you are the CEO and publisher of Legendary Games. That's true. Hi, everybody. <laughs> and uh, we uh, were fortunate enough to uh, to get your uh, get your time and talk to you about some stuff that's going on. And we we've kind of changed in the format here because something that Legendary Games is doing right now uh, we think is very important, and you guys should really kind of know about and and get on board with right away. Uh, Legendary Games is doing a uh, a fundraising campaign called Heroes for Harvey. Now, uh, Jason, could you tell us a little bit about uh, how that came about and what it's all about? Uh, sure, and, and really, it's about you know Tropical Storm Harvey going on right now on the Gulf Coast of the U.S., and, you know, mostly heading in Southeast Texas and in the Louisiana and that area. We you know have seen this up in TV. I'm based in Seattle, a long ways away, but I have friends in Texas and from Texas, and, and I've been kind of watching the news and the devastation, and, it's easy to kind of wonder, geez, what can I do in the face of something so huge? But at the same time, you don't have to, you know, boil the ocean, as my wife likes to say. You just have to do what you can do. And what can I do? Well, I publish games. So what I can do is help raise money for people who can be somewhere that I cannot. Um, Robert Brooks, one of our um, partners, he he runs his own company called Counter Table Publishing. And we partner with them on publishing their Ethereum campaign setting and some other things. And we'll talk about um, that a little later on. Robert could not be with us tonight. But he, um, we have been kind of talking about these ideas. And Robert said, hey, I think we should really uh, jump in on this. And could we offer up some sort of a, you know, a giveaway or some kind of a thing to raise money? And so I said, sure, we could totally do that. And I talked with Rachel Ventura, my, my uh, business director. And we came up with the idea of you know, the theme of heroes. And we really... We have a, a whole line of these heroes projects that are pre-generated characters for Pathfinder, although we also have some for 5th edition as well. And each one of these heroes products is richly detailed. It's you know, got these deep character backgrounds. It's got you know, a lot of complex relationships as well as characters who have you know, interesting you know, stat blocks, how they're put together. They've been a popular product when I've done for a long time, but we thought these are fictional heroes. And it's a product line that is, is cool and fun, but could we tie that together with the real life heroes who are out there, you know, on the front lines. And so we're, we really want to target locally active organizations. And it's all well and good to give to places like, you know, the Red Cross or the Salvation Army or whomever you wish to give to if you want to go that direction. You know what? There are people who will quibble with the, the methods of big companies and sometimes their overhead's a lot higher. And so they don't, not as much the money gets to the other uh, street level. And so we thought it was important to really talk with um, some local organizations down there who were doing a lot of good really on the front lines there. And so we came up with the idea of Heroes for Harvey. Our, you read about our fictional heroes at a big discount on drive through RPG, and all the proceeds from it go straight to three charity organizations that are right out there helping out both the immediate needs that are going on in Southeast Texas, Louisiana, that area, but also with the long rebuild to come i've got friends in new orleans in that area and you know hurricane katrina was 12 years ago shoot hurricane rita that came a few weeks later and hit houston at that time yeah. that was 12 years ago and they're still rebuilding in some ways from those so these are not products or projects and problems that just happen and are over with in a matter of a couple of days or a couple of weeks and so we really wanted to target what we could towards groups who are right out there and are going to be as part of that ongoing rebuilding process working with the people out there most effective no that's that's great and looking at uh your drive through rpg uh page for this bundle the heroes for harvey bundle uh that those proceeds are going to be going to the galveston county food bank 
the Montrose Center and Teachers of Tomorrow yeah. uh, right there. Um, those are the people, like you said, on the front line who really, who really need the help and could uh, most certainly benefit uh, from, from this, uh, from this fundraiser. And, uh, I, yeah, I, as soon as I saw it, I picked, I, I picked it up. Thank you. Um, and it's a, you know, all said, normally this bundle of stuff would go for about a uh, little over $22, but you yeah. guys have a special price on that. It's nine ninety nine, and again, you know, none of the money is going to us. It's all you know, route of drive through. RPG has been great about setting up their bundle. They even you know, take out their you know, they they don't take their usual cut. They basically just you know, run the the credit card processing fees, and they take that part off. After that, all of the remainder goes to the charities in question. And so it's something. It's a chance that you can get a great deal, get something fun to read. And also really help out some great people who are doing great work to really help out folks who need it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now we are actually um, work with Drive to Change. One of the charities on there, I had uh, put in the, the Galveston County Food Bank, but I'll talk to um, some friends who are from that area of Texas, and they said, you know, Galveston County is really part of the greater Houston area. And part of the reason I wanted to focus at least some of our you know work in the more outlying areas is those. Can kind of get outside the eye of the the media, and people might forget that places like Beaumont, and Port Arthur, and Corpus Christi get really hammered by these, oh, sure. and don't have the resources, and infrastructure that a big city like Houston has to be able to deal with it or the media attention. And so, we're actually going to be shifting that one to the Southeast Texas Food Bank, which is based in basically the far southeastern quarter of Texas, around Beaumont and around Port Arthur, the sort of Golden Triangle area, um, which is where the the storm really made landfall and really it was hit hard there. I mean, hey, Galveston County Food Bank, also great. If you want to get to them, God bless you, please do. But we wanted to make sure that we got some that were in Houston, some that were outside of Houston as well. Sure. No, that's great. So yeah. it's a wonderful idea. And uh, just how, how did that, I mean, you were obviously moved by the devastation in the area, but mm -hmm. what, what do you think really prompted that? The, well, the, the problem really, in this case, it was, you know, Robert Brooks, you know, he said he's uh, one of the, our partners there. He pinged me and said, hey, because we've been working on a lot of projects together. He said, is this something we could do? And I've been sort of thinking about it in general, but his e email to me was just sort of a push like, yeah, totally. Why don't we do that? That's an awesome idea. In fact, let's not do one product. Let's do three products. Let's do a bunch of stuff. Let's not just do one charity. Let's do a couple of charities. And so he had the initial kind of, nudge that moved me from thinking about it to yeah totally <laughs> let's do it right now you know what no time like the present i had um, yeah. set my business director rachel into action she worked with drive through folks and within you know, a day or so we had it all set up i will also say we are also part of a second bundle which is going to be houston hurricane relief fund and i think one other fund which i forgot what it is we have one product in that bundle i can't remember the name of that bundle but it's one that's got a bunch of publishers together um Rachel's own adventure, the it's called the Feast of Flavor, fifth edition. It's a beginner adventure, um, and it's a lot of fun. It's something that you can use to help you know, teach people how to game and help sort of introduce people to the hobby. It's got some accompanying card sets and things to go with it. So she wanted to include that in that second bundle. We wanted to do more for ourselves, so we went ahead and you know pushed through with our own separate bundle in addition to jumping in on the the multi publisher bundle that a bunch of groups were getting being a part of okay and i have a feeling i, I just did a, a quick look on here and is that the hurricane harvey charity bundle from i think it probably is yeah point of insanity game studio okay yeah i forget who was the, the kind of the top line person who was you know who owned that bundle but you have if you see any of these out there, please, by all means, support any of them or all of them. It's a great chance for you to get stuff at a great price. You know, so even if you did it for entirely selfish reasons, well, you know what? <laughs> That's okay. It's still going to lead to a good result. But you can feel good about saving money, and, you know, that's all good. No, absolutely, absolutely. 
All right. Well, uh, yeah, we wanted to hit that right out of the gate uh, yep. and, and let people know about that. And uh, we're going to kind of slide back into kind of our, our normal uh, yeah. routine here. Uh, you kind of heard him briefly for a moment. You heard Glenn, the regular co-host of the show. Uh, he is the uh, B-Movie Bunker. Jeez, uh, oh, you think I'd? this is the first time I've done the show. Huh. Uh, he is a movie reviewer on his YouTube show, The B-Movie Bunker, and the creator of the RPG, Mist Runner. Whew. How you doing, Glenn? I'm doing all right, Brad. Thank you for asking. <laughs> all right. Uh, this time we're going to skip the news, but we are going to do our regular review that Glenn does of, uh, of, a, of a game. And uh, we're going to do our Kickstarter spotlight, and then we're going to discuss uh, not just Heroes for Harvey, which we've already really kind of gone over, um, but uh, some of the stuff that you're doing with uh, your Kickstarter, which is going to be our Kickstarter spotlight, which is the Alien Bestiary for Starfinder and 5th Edition that you guys are doing. That would be great. So we're going we're gonna to hit that uh, as our pick and also as our discussion. So, Glenn, what is the game that you have found for us this week? I, seeing as we are entering towards harvest season, I have picked the game Veggie Garden. This is from Quick Simple Fun Games. Uh, creator is Kelly North Adams. This is a two to four player game. It takes about 30 minutes to play and retails for $20. In Veggie Garden, you are competing to grow the best vegetables uh, in a set amount of time. Um, however, you are competing with the other players for space in the garden. And there's possibly a pesky groundhog or a mis mischievous bunny that is popping up and ruining your plans as well. So the garden is laid out where you have different vegetables uh, laid out in the garden. Potatoes, peppers, uh, tomatoes, uh, pea pods, carrots. Um, you'll remove one vegetable from the game each time you play, so there's always one you're not using. And then there are also fence posts, and the fence posts have numbers from one to three on them. And what you're doing each turn is you start with two cards in your hand, and each turn you're drawing another card to your hand. And when you draw the card, you it's from the, a face-up pile, and when you pick it up, so if I pick up a pepper, I take the action that you do whenever you take a pepper card and some actions will let you swap cards around in place in the garden some will let you swap the numbers of the fence posts or move the groundhog or bunny if they're in the game uh, they can let you swap cards from your hand to the board and vice versa uh, or swap ones from the face of the table and so forth so you can change the way the garden is set up because at the end of the game the winner person with the most points is going to win and the way, way you get points is you look at where the different vegetables are in the garden and what fence posts fence posts they're by. So, mm. so if, if you have potatoes by a three, a two, and a two, but every potato in your hand is even worth seven points because you add those numbers together. Sure. Okay. Um, you get a bonus if you have one of every veggie as well of ten points. Uh, but sometimes that bonus isn't that great because if I can get seven points per, per potato and I end up with like five or six potatoes. It's a lot of points. That's a lot. Um, it doesn't. <laughs> that doesn't happen very often because you have to kind of try to hide what you're trying to do too. Because otherwise, if you make it too obvious, wow, he's really banking a lot of potatoes. People are going to make sure those potatoes are worth one or less because there's a the outer ring is what you score points for. There are four spots in the center. Those vegetables score no points. Oh, so okay. It's a, it's a definite balance of trying to not let on too much what you're trying to do so that people don't ruin all your plans. Huh. Yeah, it's, 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 there's a lot going on because there's really a lot to pay attention to, especially in a four-player game because they are trying to pay attention to what am I trying to do? Oh, yeah, and what are the three other players trying to do? Sure. Which can be a lot to keep track of because they're trying to keep track of you're basically counting cards. All right. Brad, Brad has... <laughs> You don't know what their first two cards were because everyone starts with two. But after that, it's like, okay, so Brad picked up, let's see, we're three rounds in. Brad's picked up a potato, a pepper, and a carrot. Jason has two pea pods and a carrot. 
and Anessa has, you know, a pea pod, a carrot, and a potato. Oh, did I get that right, or did was that you know? And then it's like, yeah. okay, you're trying to remember what everyone's picking up so that you know what they're also going for because you know then what they have in their hands. So playing with someone who has an eidetic memory would make this game a little less fun. Like my boy. <laughs> so, um, but I like it a lot. I mean, you know, it, it, 30 minutes is about right for a four-player game. A two-player game plays a lot quicker, um, like 20 minutes or so, which is great. And it's a great price point. It's 20 bucks. And it's just a fun, nifty strategy game that the rules are pretty simple, but there's just so much depth to it. So, yeah, definitely one I recommend. Yeah, this looks like a great game, especially if you've got you know younger kids and yeah. you want to work with... I know that the, the, it says age 12 and up, but I have a feeling yeah, it's... it's it, can be a, a bit lower than that. So it'd be a great thing for for math based skills for younger kids. But also uh, there's a lot of other uh the strategy portion of it like you were saying, you know, um trying to not telegraph <laughs> what you're what you're trying to accomplish while still accomplishing what you're setting out to do point wise. So yeah, there is a lot of things going on here, and that seems really cool. Uh, you said it retails for about twenty bucks. Twenty dollars, and it's about a twenty to thirty minute game. So that's that's a nice, you know, quick family family game time game that isn't gonna be going on so long that uh, younger kids get bored, which uh, uh, most certainly can happen. <laughs> No, this is a very cool game, and this is from Quick Simple Push. Fun. Quick Simple Fun. Have we talked about any other games that they've put out? That is a fantastic question that uh, I yeah. might have an answer for you I'm, in, I'm, in a bit of time because it's. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure I. The thing is, is we're hitting a point where I mean, this is what episode is this? We're on episode eighty, and 80, uh, so yeah, I've reviewed yeah, eighty games. Yeah. Um, I thought I recognized Gold Raiders, but I think maybe it was Celestia. Did, did I review Celestia? I don't think I reviewed Celestia. No, yet. no, no. No, I guess not. Now, I saw the boat and I'm like, oh, we did a boat game. But that was the uh, the Sinking Island where I can't remember yes. the name of that game now. Uh, uh, Hanamakoji. Ah, I yeah. Did, I okay. did Hanamakoji uh, just uh, not too long ago. But that's the only other one of theirs I've done. They don't, they don't have a huge... Uh, oh, gosh, yeah. That was just a, a couple of months ago. That's the... Yeah. Uh, the the Geisha. Geisha one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. No, uh, cool. I might so have you later because that's a cool game, too. Yeah. So uh, quick, quick Simple Fun has got a great pedigree. They put out great games. And if you're looking for a... Uh, a card slash... You're basically building a board with the with the with the game um this seems like a really really cool game to get so uh thank you very much for pointing out quick simple funds game called veggie garden and i want to make sure i copy the link here so i can get it in our I, show I, notes i neglected to give you that's all right <laughs> that's all right no worries i'm a jerk no, I'm a grown ass man. I know how to use a computer. I can paste it in there. We're good. All right. Uh, we're going to move on to talking about uh, Die Hard Dice. Uh, Todd from Die Hard Dice has been very kind to offer a coupon code uh, for those people who are looking for either polymer dice or metal dice. And, uh, and now they've got a number of accessories. Uh, to go along with the dice, like the new dice tower that he has. Uh, oh, gosh. I think he, he uh, started offering that a couple of weeks ago. He's got the fold-up uh, dice tray, which is is amazing. Anessa managed to pick up a couple of 
those for us we have talked about before. But uh, anything that you were to get at dieharddice.com, 10% uh, off with the coupon code Adventure Party, all one word. And uh, all the dice sets are very affordable. The metal dice sets are about half the cost of uh, metal dice sets that I've seen out there uh, on the internet. And the quality is exceptional. Um, I own uh, the nickel plated chrome set, I believe, and a number of the polymer, di polymer dice sets which uh, are, are really good quality. So uh, again, dieharddice.com, use the adventure code, or I'm sorry, the coupon code adventure party, all one word, and you can get 10% off of your purchase. Now, uh, I said we're going to skip the news and we are going to go right into the Kickstarter spotlight. And last week, or I'm sorry, I said last week, last time uh we did dare to dream which is the asymmetric card game of nocturnal terror and Ooh. i just uh the uh oops gosh darn it oops there we go yeah i clicked the wrong thing on my um uh <laughs> on many cam anyways uh dare to dream uh basically you've got uh the artwork is beautiful um everybody I believe takes on a persona of a uh, like a dreamlike character. You've got the the night teddy bear and and that. Why don't you because you brought this to the table? Yep. Why don't you uh, tell us more about Dare to Dream and how they did? So they still have six days to go. They were looking for nine thousand four hundred eighty nine dollars. If that seems weird, it's because they're in Dublin, so that's probably a euro amount that they wanted. Yeah, uh, and they are currently at. 31,297. So this is happening. Um, it was a nifty little card game where one of you plays as the darkness and the rest of you play as uh, basically the dreamers. It's uh, And yeah, it's like you're like, you know, a little teddy bear with a sword or, you know, uh, stuff like that. So you're like, you know, it's like you're the kids toys who are protecting, uh, you know, the kid at night by fighting all this darkness. And you got like a little octopus with a pop you know, cork on the barrel pistol and stuff like that. It looks really cool. The arts, the arts, what really sold me on this, yeah. aside from the fact that I love the theme, um, and I'm blanking on it. Uh, it's like legend something, but there's a comic book series that's uh, along these lines as well. That is uh, like the young boy's kidnapped by something, and his toys have to go and save him. Oh, and it kind of drew me in because of that. Sure. Um, and yeah, and it looks like a nifty little card game. So definitely happening, coming out not till April of next year, which, if it follows Cool Mini's example, an April release means I will get it uh, yesterday <laughs> on September 2nd. That's when my Massive Darkness showed up, September 2nd. Oh, really? Yep. So, I mean, it's a lot of minis, so I think they, they tend to undershoot their estimates, and I a lot of companies seem to do that. So generally, if this is a card game and they're saying it's not going to be out for a year, I think that they're they're probably pretty good in their estimate, I would think. Hopefully. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll find out. <laughs> and I know and we're going to talk with, uh, uh, because our, our spotlight for this week is something that uh, Jason's company, Legendary Games, uh, is uh, has currently going on Kickstarter. Um and I'm sure you can tell us uh, stories about how how things kind of run on Kickstarter and, and how campaigns um, kind of work firsthand, because uh, this isn't your first rodeo with working with Kickstarter. Oh, boy, can I tell you some stories. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it looks like uh, Dare to Dream is uh, it's gone well past its original goal. Six days to go, um, you know, 30... 31 grand. So they're, they're, they got it. Yeah. And let's see if you get, yeah, if you go in and this is US dollars, if you go in at 35 US dollars or uh, 30 uh, euro, you would get your own physical copy of Dare to Dream. So 
Um, you also get print and play at that level too. So if you want to um, basically print your own cards uh, and you know cut them up and make your own game uh, uh, set, uh, you can do that too. But uh, if you want to get the actual cards, uh, $35 US or 30 Euro uh, gets you in on that. So that is last week. This week, we have the Alien Bestiary for Starfinder and 5th Edition RPG. And this is not a small book by any means. And we're going to break tradition because you are here, Jason, um, and you have in-depth insight into the Alien Bestiary Project here. I do. Uh, by Legendary Games. So uh, I'm going to let you uh, take the floor here and uh, tell us all about it, Jason. Well, I'm going to uh, go back about two years or so ago, and Legendary Games started a, we did a Kickstarter project for an adventure series called Legendary Planet. And it was not necessarily a hard sci-fi. It was more science fantasy, the sort of sword and planet genre, sort of your John Carter of Mars, that sort of thing. And so it's more almost a fantastic adventure set amongst this alien setting, the alien world. And we did a great Kickstarter with that. We're still working on that. It turns out giant adventure sagas are super complicated to make. And we are sure. very, very close to being done with that one. The penultimate adventure is in at the layout person now. And then the final adventure, which is me writing it, is will be the last thing to write. And then we'll be done with that. That will be a compilation of probably around seven or eight hundred pages when wow. it's finally together. It's we did it in a uh, style much like the uh, uh, Paizo Adventure Pass where you've got, you know, a 50 or 60 page adventure, you've got new monsters, magic items, you know, and planetary gazetteers, ongoing fiction stories, and so on. And so in the course of doing Legendary Planet, we made a lot of monsters. Now, we talked really about Robert Brooks in the Ethereum campaign setting. About a year after our Kickstarter, they launched their Kickstarter, the Ethereum campaign setting, and they were maybe one or two degrees more in a sci-fi direction, but still with a dose of fantasy and also a dose of Sort of a almost a steampunk noir art deco um and a bit of cosmic horror thrown in and mm -hmm. in the process of creating their book the ethereum game pet setting campaign setting was almost 600 pages i could flash you a lovely picture of it right now but i'm not sure if my camera is picking up anything besides the legendary games logo but anyway um in the process of doing that they created a lot of alien races and a lot of alien monsters and so we thought you know there's this new game coming out. Our um, products were originally um, for Pathfinder and for 5th edition. We created that intentionally for both of those. So we had already done a ton of conversion work. We thought, there's monster books out there for 5th edition. But there's nothing really in a more of a sci-fi vein. Now, 5th edition fans, in my experience, tend to favor more traditional fantasy, um, at least based on you know the product that we've created. But there is definitely a small and interested um, and growing marketplace within the 5e community looking for things outside of your usual you know traditional european style fantasy and so we wanted to work with fifth edition and also we had a lot of people you know working for us in legendary people who had worked on the starfinder games you know, in house who had and we've been creating a starfinder version of legendary planet and so it was almost a natural outgrowth of things we were already doing we said you know what there really needs to be a great monster book for Starfinder, because there isn't one right now, and even the first official monster book coming out, the Alien Archive coming out next month, is almost more of a an alien races, kind of playable alien races book, and it's only about 160 pages. So we said, no, there needs to be a big monster book for Starfinder and 5th edition, and thus the Alien Best Year is born. We've been working on it for a while. The we have the Kickstarter already is funded. It's funded in less than two days at so ten thousand dollars. We're already en route to our stretch goals and stuff from that point on. And it's building and building because I think there's a great appetite and a great market for people who are interested in running a sci fi game, want to have all their sci fi and space themed monsters all in one place. And so there are a ton of you know new monsters, newly created creatures from Ethera, from Legendary Planet, another brand new monster that we're making for this book, as well as gathering together a lot of the space and sci-fi theme monsters that have sort of dribbled in through the years in like the Pathfinder game, but recreating them for Starfinder and 
for fifth edition. So that's the kind of the basic nut of it. The, the basic book is funded already. So the sort of starter level of the book is 200 pages of space and sci-fi monsters. And then as we go on through our stretch goals, among other things, uh, backers will be able to choose and vote on what additional monster they want to put in there. So we've done this before with Kickstarters before when we did one for Mythic Rules for Pathfinder, when we did it for the Forest Kingdom campaign compendium. Every year or so, you know, each time they achieve one of these you know, monster-based funding goals, then we post a poll and the backers vote. Whichever their top five favorite monsters are, those monsters go in the book. Now, something else from the list might end up in there, but the ones they vote on, those ones are guaranteed a spot in the book. So it's a participatory process where backers have a lot of you know, control and influence over what this final book's going to look like. So you're already getting 200 pages worth of monsters here. But as we keep going on, keep going on, there are other stretch goals as well, and they're all described on the page. We're creating clear um, plastic minis. Um, Excuse me, that are you know going to have all the terrific new artwork for these guys and the plastic minis. Besides looking cool for a sci-fi style game, also are much lighter and you know, in a lot of ways more durable than the uh, the traditional paper minis. Um, and they're easy to transport, and they're also still resistant in case someone tips over their Mountain Dew while you're sitting at the table. Um, you can just wipe them off and you're ready to go. Um, but we'll be creating these additional you know uh, uh, mini packs. We'll also be creating an additional Starfighter resource as we go along. So the first big milestone goal, after you know funding at 10,000, we're adding new monsters to the Alien Bestiary. We're adding more new monsters. And so each category gets added on more and more. We keep building up from there. At 20,000, we'll be creating a companion book, the Alien Codex. So the Alien Codex features playable races and not just sort of information about those races and some special rules for them, but also tons of ready-made, ready-to-use stat blocks for that race. So the first one will focus on the humans. It'll focus on the Autane, which are um, sort of a clockwork, cybernetic, uh, you know, half-mechanical people. There are the the Jaguadine and the Clavin. The Jaguadine are kind of evil, mad scientists and you know genetic engineers of a most unsavory nature. And the Clavin are their genetically engineered slave races. So you'll have a ton of ready-made stat blocks, much like with, say, the Pathfinder NPC codex, the Monster codex, so that you'll, you know, if you're running through a space-based campaign, you don't need to stop and make up a whole bunch of characters because they'll be right there at your fingertips. Sure, and again, yeah. much like as when you go along and add these um, bonus goals to adding more monsters to the alien bestiary, you'll be adding more alien races and more stat blocks the Alien Codex. At 30,000, we'll do another companion book, and that's the Ethera Campaign Setting Field Guide. This one takes another slightly different tweak on that. It's focused much more specifically at the Ethera Campaign Setting, which is you know what Robert Brooks and his crew are working on. And with each, um, each new section we add to that, it'll be talking about different groups and types of monsters. So how would you, what are the, the ecology of different kinds of monsters? How would you go about the harvesting alien uh, body parts and stuff for different nefarious purposes or you know <laughs> technological or magical purposes so these are all kind of laid out as part of our stretch goals that are going on and we'll reveal more as we go along but it's great to have the baseline you know funding foundation already in the can and yeah. it's adding more and more and more eventually this book will be over 300 pages and depending on how the end of the kickstarter goes we might go one of two ways if we're close to right around that end we'll probably just go ahead and stick with making one big alien book. But if it keeps going, like we hope that it will, like we think that it probably will, we may actually all um, add $100,000 authorize the sequel, Alien Bestiary 2. And we'll already, we've already got a chunk of monsters set aside for the possibility of setting them up, up and making, making a whole additional book after that. But we didn't want us to have one book endlessly getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah, yeah. Instead, we had a hard cutoff point. If we go beyond this point, then guess what? We're stopping this book here. We'll produce this book. The next book will take as long as it takes, and we'll put that in the can and we'll continue cycling along. But we want to be able to turn this around. And because we have so much of the work done already, we've got over 150 fifth edition stat blocks and monsters done now out of you know, 200 or so that are likely to end up maybe 200, 250. And 
I think somewhere in the realm of 70 or 80 Starfinder creatures done. So a lot of the work is already in hand. A lot of the art is already in hand. A lot of the art is art that's not in hand now. It's already in process. So one of the things that we've learned over the years of doing Kickstarters is don't wait till the end to try to start doing stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Make sure to get as much as you can done before you even start and then continue cycling while the project is going along. And you'll have a much happier result. You'll have a much quicker result. Other than the legendary planet, you know, Adventure Path, which has had its own set of issues. Every other Kickstarter we've done, we've done half a dozen of them, has delivered, you know, on time or early. And we expect, we expect this one to, uh, to do just the same. Nice. It, it has to feel really good to know that within uh, two days, you had, you know, you had your baseline goal done. Yep. It's, <laughs> it's nice. It's kind of a, it's a validation that, you know, all right, we're on to something here. People are interested in this. People are excited about this. We've got almost 200 backers already. And in fact, that's one of the things I see you just had on the screenshot there is backer goals. So I, quite apart from monetary goals, we can be going along. We also have additional goals based just on number of backers. So even people who say, well, shoot, I can only, I can't afford to pledge in right now. Although I should say the, the low ple end pledge goal was only $25 for the, uh, the PDF. Um, but even if you can only throw in, you know, a small amount, you can vote in the monster polls and you can help push everybody towards the um, backer goals that are out there. You know, there for, and once we hit 200 backers, we'll be creating a PDF art folio with all of the monster illustrations in the entire alien bestiary. So if you want to show off to your players, you don't have to try like sticking your hand over the stats of the monster to show them the book. Yep. <laughs> you can print it out. You can put it on your laptop or on your tablet or whatever. You think, here's what you see. And they're like, what the heck is that? They don't see the name of the monster. They don't see the stats of the monster. It's something that I think really everybody ought to do. But I think that it's a, it's a, a surprisingly handy value add for the way that we game nowadays. You know? Yeah, exactly. I you know, especially with things like uh, Roll20 and other, you know, virtual uh, gaming environments that are available for tabletop. Mm -hmm. uh, being able to, you know, slide that imagery in really can, can help uh, tie things together and make it feel um, more inclusive, I guess is the best mm -hmm. way I can think of it. <clears throat> yeah. So as close to being able to slide a book over to somebody and say, hey, check this out, <laughs> is, uh, is having what, you, what you've got set up here is just having the uh, stat-free image of, of the character for people to be able to see. And so that's cool. We also put in a various levels of sponsorships for things. If you want to you know, have your own, if you want to make sure that you can basically to, to write a ticket, to, I want this monster to be in there. If it's an official monster that already exists, you can add a sponsorship to it, and you can say, if that one's going to be in there, boom, I'm going to pledge extra money, and that monster's going in. Or pledge a little more, and you can actually create your own monster to go into the best area, or the best area 2, depending on how it goes on. If we hit the best area, the alien best area 2 level, we are planning to run a monster contest, wherein back to the third level, we'll be able to list some in monsters and then fight it out to see who gets to be in the final book. Um, That's awesome. But you can also, if you want to have a, a character, have their stat block in the Alien Codex, you can sponsor that. If you want to sponsor a piece of artwork, if you want to sponsor it, and if you want to name something in like the Ethereum Field Guide, these are all things you can do. And these are pretty popular in our past Kickstarters. It's the sort of thing you don't have to put in for with your regular pledge, so you can. Um, but you, you can, you know, either, you know, add the money at the time you make your original pledge or when we're doing our post or backer survey, though, I will say if it involves artwork, you really want to get it in sooner rather than later. Cause yep. again, one thing we've learned, you kind of got to set a hard cap on certain things. Cause again, we don't want this project to be lingering on for, you know, a year and a half waiting for somebody to give us their feedback. There's a certain <laughs> deadline. And if you don't get your information in, then your thing's not going in the book. Yep. Sorry. We can't wait all day. And so October 31st is our kind of hard cap deadline on any you know, creative input that you have. And that gives you a, a solid month when the Kickstarter ends to be able to, to get your information into us. Sooner is better. We love having people get in there. People have been so tickled and so excited when they see the artwork that they've had into our previous books, the Mythic series. 
the train with the apprentice the fourth kingdom campaign compendium they love it they gush they're excited and it's so cool to kind of see something that you helped create right there on the page yeah. i mean shoot even me i've been in the business for 15 years and one of the things that i still enjoy doing is working with artists every day if i'm freelance for somebody else i always like to see hey i wonder what art they got for my adventure or my article whatever it is that's right and that's something that really helps bring you know fantasy to life and sci-fi is no different you really get to see things vividly put there on on the case and we've got a huge team of artists that are making some amazing stuff so we've got tons of great artwork out there already and we're getting more all the time yeah i you know you've got an amazing stable of artists at legendary games i gotta say mm -hmm. um uh, i Thank you. I, I love the artwork that that I've seen for all the projects uh, that I've uh, managed to check out on Legendary Games. So it, yeah, it, I thanks for that. It, it's something that we we really had a vision for what we wanted Legendary Games to be when we started out back in 2011, and that was we wanted to you know create a a premium kind of content. We want to make stuff that is beautiful and fantastic and fun and exciting. We're gonna you know have some of the best people in the business working on them writing, but we also want these things to look great, and feel great. And so we had a particular kind of a, of a vision for the kind of artistic style that we go with. And, you know, our art style isn't the same as everybody else's, and that's okay. Everybody's got a different art style. I will say that the, uh, the book covers you see in here are mock-ups. We don't have the final cover art in yet, um, but we are working with uh, a couple of very cool artists to work on that. So if you say, ah, I'm not, yeah, whatever. The, we're still in the process. Don't worry about the cover art will be on point. If you've seen any of our book covers, you know that we got it taken care of. <laughs> yeah. What you say is going to be awesome. It's going to blow your doors up. It will be out of this world, literally. <laughs> I got to say, based on uh, on you talking about this, I bumped my uh, my backer level from 25 to 50. See, I love um, that. That's awesome. I appreciate that. And you're going to be excited when it happens. You see this book come to you in the mail. It's going to be it's going to be very cool. And and there will be more stuff that you can add on to your pledge later on. The like I said, the Alien Codex, the if there a field guide, if there is a best year, Alien best year two, if you want to add on the pawns, there will be opportunities to add additional things, and you can add them all in a bunch. You can add them all in a card. There also are you can add on a starter set of Legendary Planet Adventure Path or the Ethereum Campaign setting. And these are available. If there is available only for Pathfinder right now, Legendary Planets available for Pathfinder, for Starfinder, and for Fifth Edition. Um, and if you want to, you know, something to really test drive out and see what these guys are all about, you can pick those up at a nicely discounted price and see what the see what adventuring in the stars can be. I mean, shoot, if you want to do it homebrew and play your own adventures, God bless you. Do that. Have fun. If you want to play the official Starfinder adventures, that's cool too. Rock on. There can be great adventures, a lot of fun. Their release schedule is going to be slow, so you might burn right through their adventures real quickly. That's why it's great to have some fantastic adventures right here, ready at hand, and able to start with that. The, um, the first adventure for in the Legendary Planet series, we did it kind of an interesting way. For Pathfinder 5th Edition, we made a prequel adventure. Mm. If you wanted to start in a typical fantasy world, or hey, there's trouble at the old logging town. Let's see what's going on. Turns out everyone's gone crazy. They've been infected with an alien virus, and terrible things from beyond the stars are coming to get them. You you win the adventure, of course, because you're heroes, but at some point you've been tainted by this alien virus as well, and sooner or later you get abducted by aliens. <laughs> and then you can play out the legendary planet saga as that sort of fish out of water characters who have, you know, were born in the fantasy world, but now they're cast out into this world of high-flying you know, space adventures, stargates, and so on. If you're playing for Starfinder, we figured, you know what, you're already out in the stars. So we actually skipped the prequel adventure. We rewrote the beginning of the first main adventure to Worlds Unknown mm -hmm. and just had it start right from there, which is you wake up in an alien prison in a tube full of goo. The prison is collapsing. It's been struck by meteors. All the oxygen's leaking out. You better escape or die. Oh, wow. <laughs> Um, and then once you do, you end up on this sort of most icy spaceport sort of, you know, hive of scum and villainy, this <laughs> crossroads gateway city, just full of criminal gangs and rival merchant coteries. You're trying to track down the jaggling, you know, evil geneticist who has experimented on you and kidnapped you in the first place. By the end of the adventure, 
you've gotten your revenge, but now you're like, shoot, where are we and how are we going to get home? Cue the sure. next adventure of the Scavenge Codex. You're going to try and figure out, all right, how do we get home? You've got to start dealing with some of these criminal organizations, trying to find your way to another planet where they might have the secret ancient lost tech that will help you restore the, uh, the gateway system, and so on. The adventures continue, and each adventure takes you to a different kind of planet. The second planet is a, you know, a sort of blasted Mad Max-style desert planet. Then you've got a tidally locked world that's frozen on one side, baking on the other, but there was these immense underground catacombs where robots and undead are you know, engaged in continuous warfare. <laughs> you've got a the Shattered Zone, zone in the next adventure, written by Richard Pett, um, and in the Confederates of the Shattered Zone, you've got basically an asteroid field full of you know, cyborg space Nazis and a creepy chiton cultist. <laughs> the next adventure is a water world. You've got an invasion of these, uh, the Bill Julie, you see, the art you've got right in front of you, an invading oh, sure. army of these uh, horrifying squid people that are laying waste to this uh, peaceful water planet. You've got to jump in there, you've got to stop the war. You could actually stop the adventure path there if you once you defeat them, or you can move on to the next adventure in process right now, Mind Tyrants of the Merciless Moons, where you travel as gas giant where all these crazy people. The you're starting to get into the high leadership of the evil conspiracy hegemony. And then a the final adventure, the one that I'm writing, To Kill a Star, takes place in and around a Dyson sphere set up mm -hmm. around a, a hidden sun, drawing energy from it for some nefarious purposes. You've got to go in there and unlock what's going on and then hopefully stop them from doing their terrible thing. And I guarantee you the end of the adventure path is not a one-on-one -on -one fight against the evil emperor. That would be tough. <laughs> wow. But it will be cool and murderous. That's what Legendary Planet's all about. It's focused, again, much more on the exotic planets. It's not about high-flying space jet fighters, Star Trek, Star Wars, pew pew. It's more like a cross between John Carter meets Thunder the Barbarian meets Stargate meets the <laughs> grungy outer rim of Star Wars, kind of the Tatooine and Jabba the Hutt and all that kind of crud. And so it's much more in that sort of a vein. There is sci-fi stuff. There's trappings of interplanetary adventure. But the theme is much more about what's happening on these alien planets, alien races, alien worlds, not about hyperspace and flying through the, the void. So sure. it's it's a different take on what sci-fi can be as an adventure. And it actually fits very nicely into the Starfinder universe, if you want to play that new game. If you either make it just somewhere on the you know, outer fringes of space that has not had connection with fast and light transport yet, or if you just say, this happened about 30 years ago, before oh, sure. yeah. the proliferation of fast and light travel. You have these stargates. This just happened back in, you know, the, you know what they're calling in their setting you know, the gap of when you know nobody quite knew what happened there but then all of a sudden everybody's got you know ftl transport and and we've got a whole new setup here so <laughs> it's something you can pretty easily put in there same thing with, with the ethereum campaign setting it is designed to be kind of isolated there's sort of almost like a barrier around this uh, the ethereum system you've got like six planets in there but they're sort of contained they're sort of sealed off the rest of the universe which is one of the reasons why it's full of ghosts and horrors, because the spirits of the dead can't escape to the outer planes. And so <laughs> space is just chock full of ghosts from one end to the other, because all of these spirits of the dead are still roaming around. You've got this mysterious ethereum substance energy. You do have your know, spacecraft and stuff in this. You have aliens who came in as demon worshippers, but now they're demons they brought with them. They can't go back to the abyss, so they're all kind of stuck, and they're all pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> You've got different levels of, of mechanically awakened people, you know, powered by this theorem. And they're all kind of trying to figure out what their place is in the universe. And so you just got out of this century long war. And so there's a lot of mystery and conspiracy going on within the system between these different factions that are kind of retreated back to their, you know, their various home worlds. And they're kind of eyeballing each other with a lot of stink eye and a lot of shade and, <laughs> and not a lot of trust. Um, but the books here are evocative, they're rich. The Ethereum campaign setting is, like I said, it's all 600 pages long, about 140 pages out of mechanics. But even if you didn't ever even think about Pathfinder, for 60 bucks um, for the book, that's 440 pages of just yeah. densely packed setting material that you could easily use with any system 
from Traveler to Star Frontiers to Starfinder to Fifth Edition to whatever oh, you bless want. You. Yeah, I was going to say Star Frontiers. Bless you. Yeah, I <laughs> we 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 have a little bit of love here for Star Frontiers, uh, you know, because Glenn and I. Uh, <clears throat> I think Glenn got to play Star Frontiers far more than I did, mm -hmm. um, but it was always, uh, it's cool that even to this day, there are websites dedicated to Star Frontiers and people still trying to, you know, keep that alive and, and continue to play it. So it's kind of cool to see, you know, some of the newer products out there. Uh, mm -hmm. And there seems to be a bit of, uh, at least to my mind, and maybe maybe that's not quite right, but, uh, you know, we've had a lot of RPGs in the, in a fantasy type setting. And it's really cool to start to see, you know, like uh, Athera came on the scene and now Starfinder and the, the work that you guys are doing with Legendary Planet <clears throat> uh, to see some of that, that, that sci-fi being brought more into, uh, into that and especially into the Pathfinder and uh, Fifth Ed um, worlds there. So it, that, that's it, really cool. It's interesting to think about what's going to happen with it all because anybody who's following you know rpgs for a long time knows that you know sci-fi rpgs for whatever reason have always been kind of a niche of a niche of what the rpg industry is you know yep. travel has been around forever and it's had its partisans forever but it, it kind of grew to a certain point and it didn't grow any farther than that yep. um star frontier has kind of you know had an initial marketing push from tsr but it kind of came and went you know gamma world even you know yeah. Yeah. love gamma world it kind of it's coming with and cycled through a couple of times. Metamorphosis Alpha, you want to get even farther back, but you know Star Wars, you know West End Games, they did you know Star Wars for quite a while, and somebody else like for the Fantasy Flight's doing it now. I forget what company, but anyway, properties have come and go, gone, but none of them have really caught and stuck and grown. Yep. You know, and that will be interesting to see what happens with Starfinder. So right, clearly, it hit. The zeitgeist in a very powerful way at Gen Con. I mean, they brought more copies of Starfinder book Gen Con than they have ever brought of any product in their company's history, and it wow. sold out in six hours. It was gone. <laughs> I mean, I walked over by the uh, by the booth there from where my booth was, and when I got there, you know, around lunchtime, you know, the pile, which was you know head high, was down to like you know scraps. <laughs> even at that point and they were gone as in gone by you know two three four whatever, whatever it was in the afternoon wow and so they've already run a second printing and i just want to talk to eric bonin he said yeah i i kind of kicked myself like why didn't we bring more but at the same time as a cautious businessman i'm it's better to order too few than too many yeah no exactly i i'm yeah i yeah you don't want to get stuck with a bunch of dead product just moldering in your warehouse and not doing anything. Yeah. So um, I, I totally get the, the thing, but I also get the sense of missed opportunity. It's like, oh, geez, we could have sold them a million of these things. <laughs> Whatever. But point being, you know, people clearly were interested, and yeah. there was enough of a base, enough faith in the Paizo brand and their team that you know what, we're willing to give this thing a try. We're going to get it together. And the fact that they have the infrastructure for organized play put together also gives them a significant leg up in something that previous sci-fi games did not have. Other sci-fi games did have you know, brand associations, you know, Star Trek, you know, role-playing, you know, Star Wars, even you know, like you know, Shadowrun and Battletech. They had their you know, associations, but they didn't have a real heavy-duty organized play faction, which can help you know, churn those fans and get them from just, you know, buyers to players and then from players to habitual buyers so i'll be interested to see what happens with it and whether they're able to carry it through but certainly the appetite for it seems strong and that certainly spurred our edges we already were thinking about doing this project and like i said we had a ton of monster artwork and a lot of monsters ready to go for fifth edition and for starfinder but when we saw the appetite for you know starfinder as strong as it was we said you know what let's move that up the calendar a little bit from when we were thinking about doing it We've got the assets and the team ready to go ahead and do it now. Let's do it now. And as you see, we had our you know ducks in a row ready to get lined up. We put the Kickstarter together. We've done enough of them now that it's still fairly easy to get them organized. We have had the team working together. They're on their on the uh, base camp setup, and so 
I, we recruited a great team. We've got about 30 different people working on it right now and coordinated by Liz Waddell and Landon Winkler, who were editors developers on the Starfinder role-playing game with the Alien Archive. And so she's our uh, kind of chief quality control person in charge um, because that's kind of how legendary games go. It's that our original stick was always that when you're buying stuff from us, you're buying stuff. We started off in the Pathfinder space. We were all freelancers who were regular Pathfinder contributors. I've written like almost 70 things for Paizo over the years myself, and we've written probably two thirds of their Adventure Path modules. <laughs> he said, you're getting the same you know, authors who are writing the stuff that you're already using. You're getting fantastic production values. You know, our stuff by page count is a little more expensive than a lot of people said, and we're okay with that because we think that you're getting terrific quality and we think that you're getting terrific value. So that's just kind of how we chose to to put ourselves together and and it seems to be working. People seem to like what we're creating and we're very excited to be able to create some, such awesome stuff. No, absolutely. And if you go to uh uh gosh uh make your games legendary.com. Make your game legendary.com. Singular. No make your game yep. legendary.com. Thank you yep. for correcting. Um yep. And if you go to the uh, about page, you can like see a, a veritable who's who of of amazing people who have done a lot of great work um, that work uh, for legendary games. So uh, yeah, you you are most certainly getting what you pay for, and that's good quality, uh, experienced folks uh, making making good stuff uh, to add to. Um, to your games, uh, Pathfinder, and your stuff that does convert to uh, fifth edition and to uh, other things as well. So that's mm. that's amazing. Thank you. We, yeah, we, we've got a good, great team of fifth edition guys who are working on stuff. Probably over a dozen folks, and they, you know, a lot of cross checks there. So we've got people who are experienced in both systems. And I, I run Pathfinder more myself, um, but I also do run fifth edition some. I've done run a number of uh, summer camps. You said you had Paris Crench on last week, and he did the Trail of the Apprentice, which is a series of yep. um, beginner adventures, which are great for younger kids, but also for people who are just you know new to the hobby. And I've actually run a number of D and D summer camps at a local game store last year and this year. Oh, nice! Trail of the Appar Apprentice materials, and the kids had such a blast. Some of the kids from last year came back again this year, saying, "Shoot, I want to play that again, or I want to see what happens next." And <laughs> One of the camps we did more Trail of the Apprentice. One of the camps we did the beginning invention of Legendary Planet. So they got to kind of see what was going on with that and take it in a whole different direction. And and I must admit, I'm I've been you know gaming since 1981. And I, I did give them kind of a a brutal first ed kind of uh, AD and D style education. We had four character deaths in the first three days. <laughs> But they had a great time, and that's what it's all about. So, um, but Alien Best Air, we're excited about where it's going. We are excited about the new, you know, additions to it. So the Alien Best Air book itself is going to be terrific. But we're excited about you know unlocking the Alien Codex at twenty thousand, unlocking the Aethera campaign setting field guide at thirty thousand. And hey, if you guys keep pushing it, we will be more than happy to put together that Alien Best Air too. And bring some of the band's monsters directly into that one as well with our uh, monster contest. Yet to be announced the official name, but it will, more details forthcoming as we uh, get closer to it. Cool. Uh, you know, when you mentioned uh, the uh, the camp that you ran, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, it reminded me of a previous guest that we had, Gary Asselford, who uh, created a D&D uh, &D uh, for Girl Scouts. Yep. That's which... how Paris started writing his adventures with those kids when they were in Girl Scouts. <laughs> That's awesome. I just, uh, and uh, yeah, Gary has actually got this. Um, let's see if I can pull this up real quick. And he, he actually was kind enough to send us one, but an actual Girl Scout patch. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's, um, that's really cool. That's really cool. Um. You know, I, I had a list of questions, but quite honestly, everything that you talked about hit all of the questions that I had. <laughs> for... I say, I've done a lot of Kickstarters here, so I, maybe I, I'm, I'm good at anticipating the kind of things folks want to know. 
<laughs> and uh, yeah, you 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 hit it all. And uh, uh, I, yeah, like I said, I, I bumped up. I, I don't want just the PDF now. I, I absolutely have to have the hardcover book. And it um, will be beautiful. We've got you know great relationships with printers. We've used different printers for different projects in the past, and and um, but we, yeah, I'll say. It's going to look great. It's going to be a book you will proud, be proud to have on your already enormous and, and groaning bookshelf there with all of your gaming material. You and uh, you and Glenn both will definitely want a copy. Oh, I, I just showed you. That was my board game section. I have a whole section for RPGs. Ah. It doesn't look quite as nice, though. It's uh, I'm still in the process of uh, straightening up that portion of the office. So, but, all good. Ah, uh, yeah, we uh, we most certainly love games here, and we uh, are really glad that we had a chance to to speak to you to talk about legendary games, um, uh, your Heroes for Harvey, and especially the Alien Bestiary project that you're working on right now. So, oh, uh, uh, thank you for that. And I will say, you know, like I said, makeyourgamelegendary.com is the website. Go there and check it out. If you are interested in buying our product. We always encourage people to buy directly from us. That way we don't have to be paying somebody else 25, 35, 50% for the vendor cuts. We love all of our business partners, but we love it best when you come and shop direct with us. But <laughs> you can also follow us on Facebook at Legendary Games. You can follow us on Twitter at, at Legendary Games J. Um, somebody else had our Legendary Games already, whatever. <laughs> um, but you can follow us on uh, Google Plus. We have a page there. Um, so, but it, our website also is pretty much the most up-to-date thing. You follow us on message boards like EN World or the Paizo.com message boards there. Um, we've got over 300 Pathfinder products. We've got about 70 or so fifth edition products, and we've got a, maybe a half dozen or so Starfinder products either out or about to come out. Um, we'll have some brand new products coming out tomorrow. They're already locked and loaded and ready to drop. So oh, nice. We do stuff from, you know, full, you know, Revised versions of existing classes, new hybrid classes, new monster books, magic item books, adventures, rule supplements. Our best selling products are adaptations and extensions of the Kingdom Building and Mass Combat rules for both Pathfinder and for Fifth Edition. Um, so it's, it's the ultimate plugins line. Um, those are the products that you know people bought more than any other. Um, we've done a ton of stuff for the mythic rules for Pathfinder. We've actually done far more than Pathfinder ever did. Your prize ever did. <laughs> we did three. We did a, a a Mythic Mania Kickstarter in combination with Rogue Genius, Cobalt Press, and Dreams Guard to make three full hardback books expanding the Mythic rules. Over two thousand Mythic spells, over a thousand Mythic base, Mythic class features. If you are at all interested in the Mythic rules, and I will say we also have a whole project there on dealing with the challenge of the Mythic play and smoothing off some of the the rough edges and how the rules play. We've got great solutions for that as well. So I do encourage people, please go and check us out there. Pathfinder, 5th edition, now Starfinder. We're trying to get some Savage World stuff done, but it's been taking forever. Mm -hmm. um, but we broaden out, and you can look for stuff on Fantasy Grounds, on uh, Lone Wolf and Hero Labs. So I just want to let people know you can get our stuff all over the damn place. And we would yeah. love for you to check us out. If you ever have a question, Make your game legendary at gmail.com or hit us up on Facebook and send us a message there. Absolutely. And I got to say, I, and right now I'm, I've got the make your game legendary.com uh, site up. And uh, just looking at shopping products by category, you've got a, a very impressive list of all the different things that you guys cover. And of course, that list is always expanding. So, mm -hmm. um, and I got to say, the the layout for your shop is uh, it, it's very easy to follow and very easy to use. So uh, don't be shy to go to uh, makeyourgamelegendary.com. Again, singular, makeyourgamelegendary.com. And uh, check out the website. You can sign up for their newsletter and uh, yeah. easily shop for uh, everything that they have to offer. Yeah, so. newsletter just once a month. So we're not going to be spamming you and bombarding you. Yeah. And I... I I signed up for it and it's a, yeah, it's a monthly newsletter. So, um, well worth signing up for. You also usually get bonus preview content when as long as I don't forget to send it to right. <laughs> like usually there's something new and fun in the newsletter each month. Nice. Very good. All right. Well, you know, I think that, uh, 
we're, we ran just a little over an hour, but that's that's quite all right because we covered a lot of great material here. Uh, so I think we're going to wrap things up here. Um, but again, uh, go to makeyourgamelegendary.com and uh, you are also, I'm sure if you branch off from the website, you can find, again, you said you have Google+, Plus. you're on Facebook, um, you're all over the place. So... Uh, okay, uh, yeah, we're going to wrap things up here. Uh, if you would like to chat with uh, the hosts or other listeners of this Galactic Network podcast 24 hours a day, you can go to gncasts.com slash sign up, and we'll add you to our Slack team so you'll be able to uh, interact with us in real time. Again, you can go to gncasts.com slash sign up. Uh, for more on this podcast, including show notes, contact info, and more, go to gncasts.com slash adventure. Uh, if you have a question or comment about anything that you've heard on this Galactic Network podcast, email contact at gncasts.com, and I need to change that. That address does work, but you can contact us directly at adventure at gncasts.com. And that email comes directly to both Glenn and I at the same time. Uh, <laughs> I'm in the loop. Yes, you most certainly are, sir. <laughs> uh, we do read, listen to, and appreciate all of your feedback. And when I say listen, we have a number that you can call. You can either leave a voicemail message or you can text that number. Um, texting uh, charge may apply depending on your particular uh, package for your cell phone. That number is 805-328-3966. Again, 805-328-3966. Uh, you can subscribe to this uh, Galactic Network podcast by going to gncasts.com slash subscribe, or you can search for us on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Music, or anywhere podcasts are offered. And I want to give a special shout out to Mark Wildridge from Central Battery Music Works, who uh, created our theme music. So uh, again, I want to thank you, Jason, for uh, speaking with us about not only Heroes for Harvey, your uh, fundraising effort for the folks uh, who have been uh, hit by Harvey in, in Houston, in the Texas area, and also about uh, the Alien Bestiary Project. Thanks for having me, guys. It's been a great time. Absolutely. Thank you. And uh, Glenn, thank you for once again spending time with us. Uh, where can people find out more about you and more about Mistrunner? You can find out more about me just on Facebook. I'm on there. So is Mistrunner the RPG, as is the b Movie Bunker and Guy the Bunker Productions. Check out Guy the Bunker Productions on YouTube. And also, just follow me on Twitter, at Guy in a Bunker. There you go. I uh, want to thank everybody for joining us at the Adventure Party. May our characters never die, and your adventures always be epic. Thank you, and good night. <laughs>